Oh, Holy that was... fuck, that was nice. Titties. Massive, big honkers. I got that on um, record. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you got that on recording, but you didn't get the fucking three minutes of shit we were just talking on recording. <laughs> uh, shall we kick this thing off? Uh, something like that. Might as well. Well. You are listening to the Micro Machines podcast. Welcome back. Uh, we're coming in for a uh, brand new season. This is a uh, start of season three. Three, yeah. Yes, third season. And uh, depending on how things go, we this episode may or may not have the brand new logo. Depends on if we can pull our collective thumbs out of our ass or garrisons. Um, <laughs> hey now, hey now, they don't need to know that shit. It's just nice and warm up there, you know? I was going to say it's cozy. <laughs> well, I'm glad y'all think so, but they don't have to fucking know that shit, okay? Hey, I like God. to show off my interior decorating, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking awful. <laughs> oh, so that's why the walls are plastered right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to oh. take a drink. What a start to the season. Oh, dear. Uh, right. Would it would have been a better start if you recorded the first bit. Uh, you know, I always like seconds. <laughs> <laughs> You're not as drunk as you are last night, are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. How drunk were you last night? I was feeling pretty decent. To be honest, to be honest same here. I mean, um, went to the hockey game, and then after that we did a club social gathering at the uh, local lawn bowls and uh, if you've never done lawn bowls it's basically an excuse to drink more <laughs> nice. like, it's a sport where you can take a step back to grab your beer sl- chug it down and then take a step forward to do fucking throw down another ball so it's good fun that's and what the fuck i'm talking about beers were cheap as anything like a, a handle handle of beer was like six bucks oh yeah, a lot of people join bowls clubs just to drink. I probably would too. I hate even going to lie. <laughs> anyway, so welcome to the Micro Machines podcast again. Uh, this is the start of season three. Before we get in onto this episode, we should probably do some introductions. So you have me, Callum, from New Zealand, knocking back a nice Cody's bourbon and cola RTD. Then you got me, Garrison, over here in Kansas, drinking a coffee spiked with some whiskey. Nice, nice. Then you got me, Clint, in Indiana, and you're going to laugh at this, but I am sipping on a Baskin Robbins uh, chocolate milkshake. That sounds pretty. You know, good. yeah, about to say that's that's not nothing to laugh about, bro. That's some serious shit going on. It's yeah, the first one of the season. I love it when they open for the season. <laughs> Actually, do you know what I did on Friday night? I was drinking these uh, bourbon and Cokes, and I was having a uh, bowl of vanilla ice cream. And you, you guys have made, you know, spiders or whatever you call them, you know, when you add ice cream to, um, like, soda. Oh, yeah, floats. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I had half a can of bourbon and cola and a bowl of ice vanilla ice cream, so I might have mixed them together. <laughs> <laughs> My man. Shit was pretty good, I gotta say. It was pretty damn good. <laughs> I bet it was. Uh, so, anyway. So, to <laughs> kick off Season 3, this has been a real segmented start, but fucking welcome to the MMP. <laughs> Kicking off this season, I figured while we are currently in the midst of a Pacific-themed group build, and I kind of <laughs> had an idea of... When we're doing group builds, a lot of our episodes might be centered around that group build in a way. So, it's actually a good th- idea. Something to think about. And I figured, well, you know, we lo- we like ground vehicles, we like armor, we like tanks. What is the very first vehicle that comes to mind when you say Pacific Theater and tanks? 
Sherman. Sherman. No, it's not. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's actually the M3. Yeah. M- well, which M3? <laughs> you got to be more specific than that. We're talking American here. Yeah, well, what's your mind wander? M3 Lee, M3 Stewart, M3 Scout Car. What, was M- the Lee used in the Pacific? Yes, it was. Hmm. Um, mostly Poor by bastards. the Australians in 1945 in Burma. Was it Burma or New Guinea? They used them a lot then. Uh, they modified uh... them. They they removed the uh, you know the machine gun turret on the very top. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they took those off and then they used oh, those because all they were facing were Hargo and Type ninety seven, Type ninety sevens. Yeah, yeah. And like there was one one story of the Australians using them, and they were in a column, and it was and they were being <clears throat> quotation mark ambushed by Japanese tanks. Which shot one round, which shot them in the side, didn't go through, and all the ju- all the Japanese saw were these M3 Lees just pivot, in pivot on the spot, turn around and face them, and start firing fucking seventy five millimeters at them. <laughs> they got yeah, obliterated by because the, they, yeah, the the thirty sevens just wouldn't, and even I think the forty seven just wouldn't go through even the side of a, a Lee, and they they just got obliterated by thirty seven and seventy five millimeters. But that is spectacular. It is. So one thing about the Pacific, though, is the massive use of the LVT. Not the Higgins boats, but the LVT. There's like sort of the classic beach scene, beach scenario that you look, you know, from um, Tarawa, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. Peleliu. Yep, Peleliu. Uh, Macon's. Yeah, they were using Macon Island, weren't they? Uh, I'm sure they were. Probably, I don't well, know. Well, we're about to find out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> fucking, we're, we're here speculating. We're about to fucking talk about them. But uh, overall, the LVT is a very cool series of um, carriers. They, uh, yeah. And, you know, they just pivot. They were very pivotal to the um, Pacific Theater for the Marines. Oh. Mm-hmm. All right, so... We'll start the list with the LVT-1, also known as the Alligator. Hell yeah. So the LVT, renowned for its role in World War II, originated from a civilian tracked vehicle called the Alligator. Conceived by engineer Donald Rebing in 1933 for rescue operations in Florida's swampy terrain. Recognizing its potential military utility, the U.S. Marine Corps approached Rebling close enough, in 1940 to adapt the design for military purposes, given their amphibious combat training and emerging threat from Japan in the Pacific Theater. By May 1940, the first prototype powered by a Mercury 94K engine was ready, followed by a second prototype with a Lincoln Zephyr engine later that summer. Renamed the LVT, it was accepted for military service, leading to production setup. The LVT-1, equipped with either two 30 cal or two 50 cal machine guns, had a top speed of 12 miles an hour or 19 kilometers an hour, and could carry 18 to 24 soldiers, which is more than it looks like they would. They're cramped in there like sardines, my guy. Ah, uh, that is true. They're, you know, they're literally like stamping on them on their heads to try and get them to fit. <laughs> America. Its power came from a Hercules. WXLC-3 engine generating 146 horsepower. Notably, its cab was situated at the vehicle's bow, with early models featuring wider-spaced cab windows. The vehicle's tracks had large grouses for water propulsion and soft terrain grip, boasting a low ground pressure of 0.6 kilograms per square centimeter, which is that is low. Mm-hmm. However, its slow speed and limited suspension and track design restricted it restricted its use on hard ground. With a transmission, including a main clutch and five-speed gearbox, it was primarily employed as an unarmored cargo ferry. Oh, excuse me. Capable of hauling 4,500 pounds or 2,000 kilograms, and later, 18 fully equipped marines or uh, or 2,000 kilograms of cargo. The crew comprised of a driver, commander, and assistant driver, while marines manned the onboard weapons. Production by Food Machinery Company began in 1941, 
with the first 200 contracted vehicles. I'll just pause here to say, you, you, you know how you see like aircraft companies and they're like dedicated aircraft companies, you know, Avro, uh, North American, you know, all of those, Lockheed, yep. De Havilland, mm-hmm. recognizable names. And then you come to tanks and ground, ground vehicles and yes, and all the, they're all built by the most random companies in the world, oh, like yeah. LVTs, a food man, machinery com- company. Um, car companies, railway companies, all sorts. You know, you, yeah. I just thought it was a weird note. It's just, yeah, aircraft are like, they're all synonymous with a certain brand, a certain company, whereas ground vehicles, it's fucking whoever. <laughs> well, well, I mean, whenever more, your hobby stretches out, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, everyone needs a, a side piece. Exactly. Like, you know, my... Uh... My M1 Springfield, uh, my M1 Grand, it's it's a fully numbered matching Springfield. Uh, my buddy, though, he's got one that's made by International Harvester that's all matching. So techni- so he could technically claim it as, like, farm equipment? I get, Technically, yeah. It's a piece of farm oh, equipment. Oh, God, hell yeah. <laughs> that's fucking tense. I've just found a loophole. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, what, you, you got Callum fucking excited. Oh, <laughs> mate, I can... Oh, Technicality is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> right. After early combat experience, four machine guns, two of each type, were being fitted forward and aft of the loading area for maximum support defense. Some 1,225 of the LVT-1 series were ultimately produced until late 1942. It is of note that the LVT-1 series models were not armoured in any way and were generally intended as second-line resupply vehicles. However, crews later modified the vehicles with additional welded-on 9mm applique armour just below the cabin windows on the frontal sloped glaciers. Then the most obvious target. The 50 cal mounts were also reinforced with simple to allow simple armoured masks to be fitted and additional 30 cals were added. In this configuration, they shifted from a supply duty to a first-line assault one, first engaged in this manner at Tarawa, where shit went wrong, but that was Tarawa. The Tarawa that, invasion yeah. was not yeah. a good thing. <laughs> that yeah, a, that was just a shit show. But, I mean, up, on the fourth it? morning, we had the entire island, so... Yeah, it's just day one was a bit of a shit show, wasn't it? Yeah. They didn't reach the airfield until day two. Yeah, like day one it's, was trying to get on the island, wasn't it? And mm-hmm. since they had these, instead of trying to land in Higgins boats, they could actually you know crawl over the coral head. So, but even then, some of them, a lot of them, got stuck. Didn't, well, they just slowed down yeah. didn't they? and became yeah. very. So the targets. the first, I think it was the first uh, two waves, were in the LVTs, and then the third wave was Higgins boats, and that created basically a big ass line of beached fucking you know yeah because they got they boats. also got the tides wrong didn't they they fucked uh, the it tides was, it was a special tide that only happens every now and then that it's a lot lower I forget what kind of lunar tide it is yeah it, it always it happens just so happened war. it hit it, it always happens during the war it just happens to be oh this is a record breaking something just happens to be during this like one time they're doing stuff like you know um the Ardennes being the coldest winter they ever had on record just happened to be when they were fucking fighting over it. And, you know, mm-hmm. you know, it's always the wettest. It's always the hottest. It's, it's always during a war when it couldn't be, when things couldn't be any worse. It's like, and guess what? Nature's just like, <laughs> fuck you. Yeah. Fuck you, cunt. <laughs> right. The LVT-1 was first engaged with the United States Marine Corps First Division in resupply operations at Guadalcanal during the fall during the fall 1942 to early 43, until the full conquest of the island. These were later engaged in the, mo- in the most early island hopping operations in 1944, their most massive engagement as amphibious uh, assault amphibians came at Tarawa. More than 260 were committed in action in the first, second and third waves of landings and pursued the continuous supply of ammunition, reinforcements and fearing back of the injured. By the end of 1943, some 200 were sent to the British Army for training in preparations for future operations in France and the Netherlands. It was observed that these vehicles experienced many breakdowns and were gradually phased out by 1945. So, 
these there is no uh there are no model kits for an lvt1 which is a big shame because yeah they a look really cool and b tarawa diaries <laughs> if, yep. someone has a, if someone has a diorama of tarawa and they has lvts it's a good chance it's the wrong kind because but yeah that's okay I mean, I'd spent a long time trying to find like a decent model kit of an LVT-1. Just couldn't do it. So, of course, the early versions, they didn't have a ramp on the back or anything like that. So, literally, you're, you're having to climb out over the top, you know, where there's no protection at all when you're getting shot at. That's yeah, that'd be a bit shit. But, I digress. Very, very cool looking vehicle. Indeed. Yep. And I like that camo scheme you got had there too. The I'm gonna take a punt and say the middle right. Yep. Yeah, I've thought so. <laughs> Marine Corps, that one. Oh. Alright. Up next we have the L V T two nicknames the Water Buffalo. So they go through the various nicknames as well, so you'll notice there are some design changes. This new model represented a significant advancement over the LVT-1, boasting enhanced seaworthiness and terrain capabilities. Key improvements included the upgraded M3A1 powertrain positioned at the rear of the hull and the addition of bolted-on aluminium track grouses for improved field maintenance. These modifications addressed issues such as seawater corrosion and wear from rugged terrain. The central compartment being could accommodate 24 infantrymen in their equipment with a cargo capacity of 5,950 pounds, which is already about 1,000 pounds over the LVT-1. The that front... is crucial. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, that is a lot. The front driver compartment underwent revisions, and heavy gun ports were added over the rear of the cabin and on each side of the main compartment, manned by infantry. Typically armed with two heavy 50 cals at the front and two 30 cals in the rear, usually the, 19, the M1990A4, uh, later replaced by masked M2s. So eventually these things had four 50 cals on them, which is um, it's a Amazing. fun kind of firepower. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> However, the British could do a bit better. British variants used primarily in swampy terrains were equipped with Polston cannons, which is uh, a 20 mil, and occasionally wasp flamethrowers. And oh, uh, if you've seen photos of these with the uh, Polston cannon on, it fucking looks amazing. It's just this giant gun sitting on top where a 50 cal usually is. You see, Callum, that that's cool and all, but the British always claim they can do things better than us, but I would just like to point out their... Uh, their cuisines and call it that <laughs> hey just because they still eat like the germans are flying overhead doesn't mean that they're not cultured <laughs> they <laughs> have things like you know jellied eel and yeah that's enough <clears throat> one thing they got going for them is beef wellingtons okay i'm just gonna leave it at that and that was like, wasn't that like a gordon ramsay thing oh that was one of his things but beef wellington is like a very like classic british Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and what's the old beer. joke? The uh, beauty of their women and the taste of their food made the English the best sailors in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Hence why they had a very strong navy for a reason. <laughs> fair enough, lads. I will say the beer, the beer is really good as well. And the gin. Never tried. You know, you never had a gin? Uh, if I did, I don't remember. I probably have, but I mean, I've been plastered quite a bit, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we all saw that video. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Bro, that was fucking When you were in a, another dimension. <laughs> <laughs> that was all the time, dude. I fucking loved it. Uh, you you got to have a classic gin and tonic on a hot day. Which is, you know, it's an odd drink to come out of England, you know, a drink specifically for a hot day. Um, <laughs> must have been a one-off. <laughs> uh, all right. In 1943, upgraded versions of this vehicle, denoted as A for armor, featured increased protection with additional 0.4-inch uh, or 
16 millimeter armor plates inside the main compartment and outside to cover parts of the side skirts, nose and cab, with the cab itself protected by 12.7 millimeters or 50.5 inches of armor. Self-sealing gasoline tanks were also incorporated. Despite, these in, despite the enhancements, these vehicles were heavier, weighing 2,400 pounds when empty and had a reduced cargo, cargo capacity accommodating 18 infantrymen. What the fuck? Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll take, like, what, minus six, six guys for more armor. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. In 1944, shields were added to protect the front gunners, typically equipped with 30 cows. A total of 450 of these armored versions were manufactured, lacking, lacking tank turrets for additional fire support compared to the other A variants. The LVT-2 saw extensive action in numerous campaigns, including Tarawa. Well, I retract that last statement I said about Tarawa dioramas. Anyway, Tarawa, oh God, Roy Namar, Cape Gloucester, Northern, fuck me. (laughs) I should know this word. I've literally just played the campaign on uh, Easy Red. Kwajalon, Saipan. Guam, Tianan, Peleliu, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. However, they had significant drawbacks, such as requiring infantry to, to disembark from the vehicle, exposing them to enemy fire. Additionally, the absence of a ramp made it challenging to store large loads inside, such as artillery. These shortcomings were addressed in subsequent models, the 3 and 4. If you want to find a model for this, uh, at the moment, all I could find were two, one of them being the 50, 56 scale uh, LV. LVT2 or A2 uh, from Rubicon, if you make that weird as scale, or a Tallery, where you can make an LVT A2 Saipan in 35th scale, which is kind of your only option at the moment. And that's what uh, Nick's doing in it. Uh, No, he's making, well, he's making an LV, uh, it's a (coughs) 2, but it's a different type, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Ah, gotcha. But uh, yes, very. This one, like this one's the sort of sleek, sporty version compared to the uh, one. I think. Looking back at them, yes. Yeah, yeah, a little, little bulky or uh, less bulky. It seems more sleek. Mister Lightning. Not a lot of um. Not a not a lot of height when you're in the water, though. That bottom, like the bottom photo. That water is right up to the very top. That is disconcerting. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, when you're trying to have a low profile, I'm I'm sure it really doesn't honestly help, but it probably that just like concrete armor was like a that psychological factor. Yeah, probably. All right. Up next, we have the LVT-3 Bushmaster. It's probably one Raw? that I'm at least on about. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is this one. I think out of all of them, this is the biggest, the biggest That's version. Beefy. Like the that guy is fully baddest. standing. That guy in the center is fully <clears throat> standing up, and he's just reaching the sides. All right, <clears throat> the LVT-3, developed by the Borg Warner Com- Corporation as their Model B in April 1943, introduced significant improvements. Featuring a rear ramp for crew disembarkation, it allowed troops to avoid enemy fire. I bet they had that uh, big on the brochure. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Powered by two Cadillac engines connected to a hydromatic transmission similar to those used in M5 Stuart tanks, it provided four four forward and one reverse speed. The rear ramp was hydraulically operated, and the spacious cargo bay could accommodate a jeep, an entire company, or four tons of cargo. God damn! Yeah, this is the this is the big boy, the heavy lifter. Gunners had a designated area for heavy heavy machine gun operations, while the crew cabin, positioned closer to the bow than the previous LVTs, offered excellent peripheral visibility with five bulletproof glass windows. The Bushmaster tracks employed rubber bush type links with 103 track segments per side, 12 inches wide. Something Garrison doesn't know. <laughs> well, for your information, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> Addition, 
Optionally, applique armor could be added, though this reduced cargo capacity by to 1.3 tons. Oh dear. Production totaled 2,962 units between 1943 and 1945, completed by Ingersoll and Graham Page. In 1949, enhancements were made to the LVT-3, including the installation of an armoured roof over the cargo bay and an extended bow to improve buoyancy. Armament See, upgrades... here, here we're moving into, like, the wannabe 113s. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Uh, where was I? Armament upgrades featured two 30 cal machine guns and turrets, and one addition and an additional one mounted at in the bow in a ball turret or a ball, mar- ball mount. Fuck me, ball mount. Yes, Long Beach Naval Shipyard converted 1200 units to this LVT 3C standard. The split aluminium car- cargo cover could be folded atop either sponson, and escaped hatches were installed along with added side armor. These modifications increased the overall weight by approximately 6,000 pounds or 2,700 kil- kilograms compared to the LVT-3 standard. Jeez. The first known use of the Bushmaster was in Okinawa in April 1945. Before that, they were most like- Before that, they were most likely stockpiled or used for training. LVT-3Cs took part in the, took part in, uh, took part in the Korean War, landing in Incheon, in September 1950. And again, I can't find any models for this, which is a crying shame because, you know, they were used in the Korean War. We need more Korean War stuff for modeling. It just seems like the Pacific in general when it comes to infantry and armor, not just World War II, but just throughout is lacking very much. Yeah. Like, the Korean War is basically, like, what like, sort of, what would happen if the Japanese war just contain, continued, you know, with, like, the Pershings and everything. It's like, you know, the Korean War is basically like, you know how they, everyone fantasizes the German, you know, German War 1946-47 sort of stuff? Yep. That's what the Korean War is for the Pacific, basically. Pretty much. Yeah. Alright, and lastly, for the <laughs> LVT standards... We have the LVT-4 Water Buffalo. Yes, they went back to the Water Buffalo. And that is because this is based on the v- the 2 series. So, the fourth LVT developed in 1943 was based on the LVT-2. Marked a significant advancement by introducing a stern ramp for personnel and cargo unloading, addressing early battle reports of casualties during troop landings. Like when you're trying to climb over something and getting schwacked. <laughs> That never happened. What are you talking about? <laughs> it underwent a complete redesign, in, including relocating the engine behind the driver's cab to expand the cargo area and accommodate the rear loading ramp, enabling increased troop capacity from 16 to 30 compared to the LVT-2. That is a big jump. Mm-hmm. This, this rear configuration provided better protection for landing forces and simplified loading procedures. Wash vanes above the tracks helped expel water, push pushed by the grouses during motion. Powered by a Continental W670-9A engine driving front sprockets through a short prop shaft, it featured a torsolastic transmission with a five forward and one reverse Spicer gearbox. That sounds very technical. If you want, sounds you like a whole yourself. lot of, uh, I don't give a fuck, get me to the beach. <laughs> The driver's visibility was enhanced with two large bulletproof glasses, and access was facilitated by two top hatches. Motion was supported by 73 track links per side with grouses, adjusted by idler and sprocket mechanisms, and suspended on 11 independent bogey wheels and two return rollers. Armament consisted of 12.7mm and 7.62 machine guns on four side pintle mounts operated by the squad, along with a ball mounted 30 cal in the front cab manned by the co driver. Additional applicate armor could be added with 13mm or 0.5 inches on the front and 0.25 or 6.4mm on the sides, albeit reducing payload capacity by 3,000 pounds. Mm. More than 8,300 were produced from December 1943 to the end of the war by the Food Machinery Corp in Lakeland, Florida, Riverside, and San Jose, California, the Graham Page Motor Corps in Detroit, Michigan, 
and St. Louis Car, St. Louis Car Co. at St. Louis, Missouri. The LVT-4 was first used at Peleliu with LVT-2s. This operation showed how far the designer's effort resulted in a better machine. Useful, well protected, and reliable. On the long run, the engine's location facilitated its maintenance. This, but this relocation had a backdrop as there were apparently an inadequate cooling system, causing the engine to overheat. The first lovely. marine division. <laughs> sorry, I said lovely. <laughs> The first Marine Division tested before the operation three LVT fours with the new Navy Mark One flamethrowers, a fourth LVT providing support providing supply. This unit was given to the first amphibian tractor battalion. The Navy Mark One flamethrower was modified after the Canadian Ronson, and its range was 75 yards with gasoline oil mixture, and up to 150 yards with napalm bursting to with napalm bursting to 55 to 80 seconds. Mm. Oh, amazing! <laughs> oh, that's. Uh, that, I think I saw a photo. Of, seen a photo of that, and it's um, yeah. That shit gets me hard as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> LVT fours participated in the Saipan campaign of June 1944, Guam and Tiananmen, and July 1944. LVT fours were also used by British and Canadian troops during the operations in the Netherlands like the Battle of Schilt in October 1944, and by Allied forces when crossing the Rhine in March 1945, Operation Plunder. Gonna plunder the German ass. <laughs> Others were provided by Lend-Lease to the Red Army that were that used these vehicles when assaulting the well-defended Odor and Dombe West Banks. After the war, French vehicles took part in the Suez Crisis Intervention and Indochina War, and USMC vehicles were used in Incheon in Korea. Uh, if you'd like to look at the uh, top middle, that is a British uh, LVT-4 with the British configuration, the uh, 20mm Polston cannon on the top. If you want to make one of these... Um, well, you have two from AFV Club if you want to pay too much, and one from <laughs> Italeri if you want to swear too much. Yeah, I'll pay too Pick much. Pick your poison. <laughs> I will say though the um, middle LV, the middle AFV Club one with the shark's uh, face on the front, that one's pretty dope. I do like that. Yeah, one. that shit's pretty cool. I want right. to get one of these and like HIDF it up. Oh yeah. It's Perfect for an HIDF. Well, considering that, like, you know, uh, you, you guys have watched the Pacific, haven't you? Up uh, like oh, yeah. five times. Like these kind of things were definitely useful for, say, you know, the episode when they're in Okinawa and they're like, like knee deep in mud and stuff yep. like that. LVTs are like perfect for that. Like, you know, other tanks would probably sink. These things would just be like, nah, we're fine. <laughs> it's all fine. We're good. Don't worry about we it. We will literally float. Yeah. It's like, it doesn't matter. We'll never sink. That but is true. That is all for the standard LVTs, but of course they made some modifications to make them even cooler. I want this, this one. The first one, the LVT-A-1 Amtrak. After initial amphibious operations in the Pacific, it became evident that the standard firepower of the LVT was insufficient against Japanese bunkers and fortified positions. Even tanks. Well, I didn't write that down, but, you know, you know what little few tanks the Japanese had, I'm sure they might, might have been a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, Sherman's going to mop them up. Hell, even a bloody uh, bazooka would go through the goes from one side to the other of a bloody um, Hargo, a Type 95. Hey, hey John, get your spoon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a fucking bayonet or a knife will disable a bloody Hargo, so what do you expect? Yep. A rock. <laughs> <laughs> right. Hold to in one can opener. <laughs> <laughs> to address this need for increased firepower beyond the typical 50 cows, a concept emerged to provide to convert production LVT-2 water buffaloes into fire support ships. Equipped with M3 Stewart like light tank turrets, so they're not fully. They they look like M3 Stewarts, but they're not. You know, differences. They're similar. 
designated the Stuart with a, turret from Wish. Basically. <laughs> designated with an A for Armored, 510 units were manufactured by the Food Machinery Corps until they were replaced in 1944 by the more heavily armed LVTA-4s. Derived from the LVT-2 Water Buffalo, this fire support variant featured additional armor and was equipped with a turret similar to that of the light tank M3 housing a standard 37mm rifled gun M6 and a coaxial 30 cal machine gun. Rear mounted Browning M1990 A4 machine guns were placed behind the turret shielded for protection. The 37mm gun could effectively engage light pillboxes and concrete obstacles with high explosive rounds, while armor piercing rounds were more efficient against tanks and fortified positions. The vehicle's deck was fully armored against shrapnel with 51 millimeters of frontal protection. Like nice. these things had way more armor than you think they would. Like, Honestly, there are, yeah. There's yeah, light definitely. tanks with there's like medium tanks with less armor. <laughs> and it's angled. <laughs> Boing. Oh yeah, that that angling. Uh, da, 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 da. Modifications included a ball mounted gunner position, an elongated rear compartment to accommodate the turret. Despite these changes, specifications remained akin to the standard LVT-2, included bolted-on grouses for easy replacement and a rear-mounted engine. With a crew of six and limited internal space due to ammo racks, the, the vehicle primarily served as a support unit with no capacity for transfer, transporting additional troops. On land, it could reach speeds of 40 kilometers an hour or 25 miles an hour, but its swimming speed was restricted to 11 kilometers an hour or 7 miles an hour. Capabilities included climbing vertical obstacles, spanning trenches, navigating gradients with a range of approximately 101 to 201 kilometers, depending on water or land. The LVT A 1 soldiered throughout the Pacific Campaign. At Roy, the men of the 24th Marines were supported by these vehicles but the reception was mild at best. They could just not get close, and close up enough to effectively support the troops on the beaches. This was not noticed by Colonel Hart, the regimental commander. He instead planned for these tanks, he instead plans that these tanks would precede the infantry assault and eventually lead the advance far and land. In fact, these objectives, objectives were never reached. And the vehicles ended up firing from afar without much precision. They were slowed down or stopped by lagoon anti-tank obstacles and ditches. Other LVTAs were supported, also supported the 22nd Marines landing at Ingleby. Ingleby? Close enough. <laughs> in, in, Ingeby? Ingeby? Somewhere in the fucking Pacific. Yeah, some little fucking island that's like two kilometers wide. If that... Uh... By mid-1944, they were all replaced by much more capable 75mm gunned armed LVT-A-4s. Now, if you want to make one of these, Italeri has one in 35th, which uh, Nick Scaled Armor is currently making. He actually bought a whole bunch of aftermarket for it, including metal, gun, uh, metal barrels for the machine guns and the 37. My man. So his, his nice. one is looking real good right now. Uh, Dragon also have it in their 72nd Armor Pro series, and also Rubicon in 56 for the weirdos. Hmm. But, uh... Ugh. Otherwise, very cool looking aircraft, and if you play War Thunder, these things are a prick and a half to try and kill. There's <laughs> a lot of space in them, and when you've only got solid shot... <laughs> <laughs> They are fun to use in war. What's that one map where it's a, uh, it's a town and there's a river running through the center of it? Oh, um, oh, I know the one. I don't know the name, yeah. but I know exactly the one. Yeah, you just climb in, you just jump into the water immediately and just swim it. Yep, and just swack people because they're not expecting. You know, they don't know shit about armored vehicles, so they're like, ah, no one's gonna be in the water. <laughs> and then boom, ammo rack, bitch. <laughs> All right, the LVT A-4 Amtrak. This is like the cool version. An armored variant derived from the LVT-2, known, known as the LVT A-4, was manufactured concurrently to offer fire support utilizing the M8 uh, 75mm howitzer motor gun 
gun carriage turret. Despite being fully enclosed, the decision to remove the two forward machine guns later proved to be a significant tactical drawback, mainly because the Japanese like to run at you. <laughs> when, you can't, when they get close enough, a 75 won't do much. A total of 1,890 LVTA-4s were produced. They played active roles in the landings and operations of Saipan, Guam, Tianan, and Iwo Jima. Uh, if you want to build these again, uh, your only two choices are Dragon and Italery. And the Italery one looks very old. But uh, otherwise, very cool-looking vehicle. You're going to actually... If you look bottom right, I've just noticed. So you know how they removed the uh, ball mountings and stuff? These guys See. have put them back in. Like, field modded them. Because you've mm. you got a 30 cal on the front there, but that's not like an official ball mounting or anything. It looks like they've just drilled a hole down. <laughs> to throw the shit in there. I think they just got sick of being bum-rushed by the Japanese all the time. <laughs> I mean, that's why... I mean, think about it, like, people think that, uh, or, like, you see people on YouTube or whatever who build, like, World War II Shermans, and they'll throw, like, 50s or 30s on top. The Marine Corps stopped putting those uh, machine guns on there because the Japs would jump up and utilize them on the, the American infantry. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why they started putting spikes and shit all over the uh, Shermans, which makes them look metal as fuck. Oh, dude, yeah. It looks I, so cool. I, I thought about putting some on China Gale, but all the other Shermans on Tarwa did not have them. So I was like, fuck. Okay, uh, fine. That was, a, that was definitely like a late war thing, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it, mm -hmm. I think it started in Iwo Jima and then on to Oki. Oh, yeah. Wait, Iwo Jima had trees? Yeah. Not after the Navy was through. <laughs> <laughs> this fucking guy the oh, US I mean, Navy logging division <laughs> forestry <laughs> I mean, there was, there's trees just because they're not standing up anymore right? <laughs> that's true they never said the tree had to be standing these are all facts gentlemen facts 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 alright and the last one <laughs> The LVT-4F Sea Serpent, the coolest name of them all. The sea, sea Serpent? Ser sea Serpent was designed by the 79th Armoured Division for use by the British in the Far East. Its armament was two wasp flamethrowers and a machine gun. These would have <laughs> been used by the Flame Battery of the 34th Amphibious Support Regiment Royal Marines in the assault of the Japanese mainland, but the war ended before they could be used. I'd just like to say... Oh, I would just like to say, how cool would that be to say I was part of the flame battery of the 34th Amphibious Support Regiment? That's just Pretty a cool title. Metal. Yeah, that's just a cool title in and of itself. Um, now, of course, there are definitely no models you can build of the Sea Serpent, but you can find conversion kits out there if you want to. And I would honestly love to because it looks really, really cool. Hell yeah. And that is it for the LVTs. That is all the uh, models, makes, and everything. As usual, there will probably be someone commenting, no, I missed this obscure one, but who cares? <laughs> you got the general idea. You learned something you didn't know before. There you yeah. go. And hopefully you get inspired to build your own one, because everyone should, because Pacific War is not represented enough, and people need to get their act together. <laughs> Sounded but personal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, trying, trying not to be, but it's hard. You know, it's hard to not make it. It is hard. Wait, it's hard is that a personal time. attack? <laughs> Just because you need a little blue pill, it doesn't matter. I take the, I take the yellow pill actually. Okay. Oh, mother's little helper. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Oh, I cannot wait for fucking October to go oh. drinking and bullshitting. It's gonna Jesus. Be great. <laughs> All right. So we're going to have a brief intermission. Then we're going to get on to a very short model news and catch up with what's been going on lately. So we will be right back. Hell yeah. 
<laughs> I started painting the uh, the Marines. Yeah, I went with this uh, USMC tank crew uniform, and it actually looks really fucking good. I'll send a picture. And I was I was gonna do all their uniforms that uh Marine Corps camouflage pattern, but looking more at pictures of Tarwa and red I think it was red one that pushed down Green Beach. All those dudes had green uniforms with the camouflage helmet colors. When did the camouflage helmet cover come in? Uh, I know in Papua New New Guinea that no not Papua New Guinea. Uh what's that one island after Guadalcanal? Um Cape Gloucester. Yeah. Yeah, Cape Gloucester they had had the camo helmets. Um yeah. Alright. Right, I'm just gonna go for a quick slash and then we can get back into it, eh? Okay. I just sent a picture of the uniforms. That's what I've got so far. I think it'll be a very nice contrast against the uh, the sandy, grassy little bits of uh, tarwa I'll be doing. Oh, dude, I, I got a really nice static grass applicator for Christmas that I haven't used yet. And I'm going to be able to use it for this build. I'm so stoked. It is... Junip. Jun, Junip. J-O-U-N-J-I-P. Yeah. Yeah, wife got it for me for Christmas. It's uh, And I like this one a lot better. I haven't used it, but I like the idea of it a lot better than my old one because it has different size uh, for the metal grates for the grass to go through and it's a top feed. It's not like the handle is straight down like a flashlight. It's not off to the side like my last one. So it's going to be a lot easier to actually be able to shake it. And I'm just so excited. That and uh, being able to – did I tell you how I'm going to do the uh, the grass or the sand for the Tarwa diorama? Nope. So I'm going to go through, and I've got Vallejo ground texture paste, and it goes out pretty smooth. So I'm going to put that over the entire thing, go through with the snow flock, add a bunch of the snow flock into the ground texture over top, let that sit. Then I'll – obviously I'll paint it and – give it that like grainy texture like sand because the ground texture just looks like ground like it's not like sandy so very exciting oh speaking of, i'll get that later actually fuck okay do you see the uh calvin do you see that picture of those marines yeah the uh okay there we go Fucking have you tits. Have been watching any of uh, Night Shift's build of uh, King Kong? Oh no, but I did. I, I watched the first bits. I haven't watched this final. I gotta watch that after this because I, I haven't, haven't watched Night Shift in a long time. Dude, his fucking King Kong Sherman looks amazing. Oh yeah, I haven't like, watched just, his videos in a while, but it's like when I seen the King Kong that he started building. It's like, yeah, I gotta watch this one. Oh yeah, same dude, same. <laughs> I got. I just got discouraged when the on his uh, Valentine tank vi- oh, video. Oh, all that crap he did. Yeah. Well, it's like when he was uh, when he does the modulation to the point where a brown a tank that's supposed to be brown is now yellow. <laughs> yeah, it's just too much. It's like now you went you went too far. Bring it back. Yeah, I mean he does some cool stuff, but it does look a little too cartoonish. Like I. I hate the point in his videos where you're watching. You're like, okay, that's that's got to be done. Like, that looks amazing. And he's like, all right, my friends, on to the next step. It's like, bro, <laughs> what next step? Matt coding? Just leave it be. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like I mean, when you spent seventy hours just chipping a tank, I'm like, yeah, I, 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 no, I can't do that. 
I've got <laughs> I've got a life. I may be a mediocre modeler, but I'm happy with my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> non modelers are impressed by it. That's all I need. That's exact. Yep, <laughs> it gets me a couple of awards, and people like it, and it looks good. I'm just <laughs> fucking called a day. If it ain't oh. broke, don't fix it. I uh, guess what I found today in my truck. What? What'd you find, buddy? Uh, remember, I told you, you know, when I went to the show, I took my uh, Chi Hall diorama, and the yes. dust cover had gotten like popped up and over and took off uh, the heads of two of the marines on the base. Yep. I, I found the heads today. Fucking tits. Yeah. Were you able to put them back on or are you just going to leave them off? Uh, I don't know. I'll put them back on. I'm missing a hand of one too, so I gotta find fucking hand to somewhere in my truck. What, uh, I can't remember. Do you, did you have a specific island that you put that Sheha on, or was it just a Pacific scene? The Tarawa. Tarawa, okay. Tits. That's what I thought. I can't remember if... I thought it was Tarawa, but I can't remember. I didn't want to put that in your mouth if it wasn't. Yeah, it was. Oh, okay, that uh, book that um, uh, Don told me to start reading about uh, Chester Nimitz. Mm-hmm. It's, like, it's an amazing book, but the Arthur... Uh, pronounces Tara Tawawa. Uh, <laughs> dude. Yeah, the guy, because I've been reading with the old brief by Eugene Sledge, and the guy who narrates it does the same shit. It's like, yeah. bro. I mean, it's not mentioned often, so it's, it doesn't bother me too much, but fuck. Well, it's like um, I'm listening to uh, Over the Top uh, podcast. Where it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's a chronological order of World War One. Oh, yes. And the guy, every time he talks about the British, uh, like the and the um, the rifle, the Enfield, it pisses me off because he pronounces it as Einfield. Uh, it's like there's no I in Enfield except for the field, not in the N. <laughs> it is. It's like you listen to everyone. It is Enfield, not Einfield. I'm different. Ugh, yes, that's the only thing. That's, that's the only complaint I have. Or so, except, no, he does put sound effects in of, like, explosions and gun f- t- gunfire, which would be cool, except that shit's, like, twice as loud as, like, his voice. So I'll be, like, at work, earphones in, out on site, and I'll fucking jump, and it's just because he's made an explosion really loud out of nowhere. It's like, <laughs> okay, um, Jesus Christ. You're about to get some PTSD, my guy. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club, buddy. <laughs> Vibrations scare me. Vibrators scare you. Vibrate. I mean, yes, vibrators scare me, but vibrations, like big vibrations. Oh, okay. Has Beth been getting a little bit kinky lately or uh, trying some new <laughs> stuff? Well, if, if you want to name the mortar that almost schwacked me and my squad in 29, Beth, and sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hang on a minute. You went, You never went to an active combat zone. <laughs> yep, exactly. That's the shitty part. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> friendly fire ain't fucking friendly. <laughs> blue on blue. <laughs> hey, dick nuts, wrong team. Yeah, You're supposed well, when... to be aiming for Tojo and Fuckface over there. <laughs> when, when the problem comes when you're hazing your brand new boots who've never really been on a gun before, like an 81 millimeter mortar, and then you haze the fuck out of them as they're putting in all the fucking coordinates and shit. And then they fucking send it without you checking it. <laughs> it makes a problem. Did you did you say that video I posted of the uh, what happens when you don't stamp the, the base plate down properly? Yes. Oh my yes. god! I fucking, <laughs> fucking shit myself. <laughs> the fucking tube ends up facing the guy who's holding it down. It's like Jesus fuck, bro. That like half second where I just kind of stared at it. I was like, oh god, no move. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so. That's what death is like. Have you guys seen the video about uh, the Russian troops that's getting all this mortars from uh, fucking North Korea? Oh, and, and it's got it's... the wrong type of propellant. It hasn't got enough propellant charge in it. Oh, the one I've seen, it's like out of like six, only one actually fucking flew out the tube. Oh, God, that is so scary. Yeah. And it's the... like, yeah. It's, after they was done, it's like they just picked up like the fucking duds. It's like, oh, no. <laughs> it's like, chuck them things. 
Well, put, um, put a couple uh, little orange flags with UXO written on it and leave. <laughs> and never come and back. Because I saw that, like, a lot of them, they don't have enough propellant charge in them because they've been, like, you know, short-changed. Yeah. So, like, they've dialed in on Ukrainians, but then when they're firing, they're firing short because they don't have enough propellant and they haven't ca- calculated it and factored that in. So they're, like, landing amongst their own guys. That's kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> right. Nuclear superpower, man. <laughs> <laughs> Should we get back into it? Yes. Let's get back into it. Okay. Three, two, one. And we are back for the hobby news. Of course, there is a uh, fuck all in the old hobby news, but we'll still go through a few of them just to, you know, show off. All right, next. Right. So up first. Um, <laughs> so since Tacom released their Tiger tanks, everyone has to release a Tiger tank. And amusing hobby, uh, re-releasing one with brand new parts. However. I will give this one a pass. Do you know why I'll give this one a pass, Garrison? I, I mean, know. it doesn't look like an actual Tiger tank, so it looks it like is, a prototype or something. It is the Tiger Porsche, the P variant that never went into production. The um, you know, the one that was um, competing against what we know as the Tiger One. So I oh. will give them credit. They are bringing out a Tiger P 003 with Zimmerit. Uh, I'll let this one slide. Because I will say, I don't want a tiger, but I will take a tiger P. Yeah, I want a Porsche. Just for the fact that, like, Fernand. Damn. Yeah. Actually, I'll take both of those, to be honest. Yeah. Um, But I just like the fact that the uh, tiger Porsche could go forward and backward in the exact same speed because of their transmission. Russia, take notes. (laughs) Uh, Wasn't the Porsche uh, electric engines? Yes. Which meant they what? Had, yeah, they had electric engines, so they overheated a lot. <laughs> I don't want to hear shit about electric vehicles. <laughs> Last year, generation actually the Nazis tried it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so how about you fuck off, Boomer? Ooh, okay, okay this is cool. This one's for Gareth. Oh, that is fucking sweet. Oh my god. From Fine Molds, who we know is a very good company there, bringing out the Imperial Japanese Army Military Horse-Drawn Cart, the Type 39 Transport Cart Co., which uh, has one cart, one horse, and one trooper. So if you are into doing the Japanese ground war and stuff like that, this would definitely be one that you'd want to add. I'll also like to add for all listeners, they, the horse has a hat on it. So I was going to say, it's got a little hat. hat. <laughs> it's, got, well, it's got a hat. <laughs> that's just so cute oh i know i love just that bit i just want the horse just to have it have a hat on it it's just yes. so cool <laughs> dude uh I, i'm gonna butcher her name sioni 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 this would be something i would love to see her build yeah oh definitely. yeah we, we gotta get her on the podcast for a japanese episode yeah we totally will okay oh. uh, up yes. next from Dynamo Models, for all those who are interested in the early war stuff, you know, when France was getting its ha- ass handed to it. Although, I say that, they actually did a fairly... If they were a bit uh, more organized with their tank div- tank uh, divisions, they could have actually done a bit more damage to the Germans. But they're French and they don't know what they're doing. So, anyway, <laughs> from Dynamo Models in 35th scale, we have the French anti-tank gun 25mm SA-34 Type 2, which is a 25mm single-shot anti-tank gun, which is a strange caliber for a single shot because, you know, most 25mm are auto cannons. Mm-hmm. However, they are bringing out a premium edition, which will include a metal gun barrel, 3D printed wheels and accessories, and this is done in collaboration with uh, Ammo. Ammo by I me. I need, so. I need this so bad for an HIDF scene. <laughs> now, I'll take the, it. Yeah. Does the premium edition also come with a white flag? <laughs> <laughs> no, but gu- metal gun barrel barrels are easier to bend. <laughs> However, I wouldn't mind having one of these if I also had a... Oh, what's that thing in the background called? A Oh, yeah, the tankette. Yeah, the tankette. The... Oh, fuck. Uh, 
I can't remember the name of it. But... Well, well, the name changes depending on who's which country has built it. Yeah. You know, I think it's like a, originally a Lloyd Lloyd gun carrier, but then the French one is got a different name. Either way, yeah, I wouldn't mind having one of these to be honest. As much as I rag on about the French, I wouldn't. Yeah, it's kind of a cool looking gun. No, it is pretty cool. And lastly, from a pretty old company, we've got AMG, Arsenal Model Group. They are bringing out four new kits. Uh, three uh, three of them are very interesting. One of them I've actually built. We have three Aerosans. Now, if you don't know what an Aerosan is, it's basically uh, it's a vehicle on skis powered by a an exposed aircraft engine with a propeller. Mainly, uh, mainly for snow and ice operations, they were actually very, very fast. They used to use them for racing as well, which is kind of cool. The uh, Soviets used them a lot, which is why we have the NKL-26 Battle Aerosan in Finnish service. I built their one in Russian service, which um, it's got a lot of metal parts. It's got metal parts and photo etch and stuff like that, so... Oh, if nice. I built it now, I'd say I used to say it was a bad kit. I only say that because I built it with experience. With like, I built it in the first year I started building again, so it wasn't good. Yeah. I'd say it was just a, it was a product of my own inabilities. I'd yeah. say if I if I built it now, it would be a lot better. So I'd say it is a decent kit. It's just I didn't know what I was doing. So we have that in Finnish service, and we have a uh, two Max Henschel Aerosans, which are used by the Germans. Uh, we have an attack version that has an MG34 on the top, as well as an ambulance version for all those. They both come in 72nd or 35th scale. They come with. They also have plastic photo etch, film decal, and mask masks. And a new release for AMG: the Hawker biplane family, the Hawker ADAX, which. Uh, I believe was a 1930s trainer light bomber based off the Hawker Heart. Uh, you have the Hawker Heart, Hawker Demon, all of those really nice looking in uh, inline engined biplanes. Really nice family of aircraft, beautiful looking. This uh, this is coming out in 48 scale, plastic photo etch, decals, films, all of that. Definitely a kit I wouldn't mind having, to be honest, because that Hawker range is just, it's a real nice looking aircraft. And that's it. That's all we got for work, work, um, model news this week, just four of them. So we're burning through them pretty quick. Real quick, did, was there a release date for that French artillery piece? Uh, or AD piece? Should be soon, I think. <sighs> I because you say it's French, early World War II. It wouldn't be far off to say that the French utilized them in Indo Indonesia during Indo the China. Vietnam War, and whatever during <laughs> during the Vietnam War. You might right? better search it up because the French went a bit weird with vehicles and stuff after the war because they didn't. They were trying to restart production that had been closed down for the entirety of the war, so. You need to search that one up, I think. Oh, for HIDF floor. Oh yeah, then yeah, they'll probably do it. Yep. You know the the French used it and then they left it and then you know fucking <laughs> Habibi and his girlfriend got a hold of it and brought it back to Tanoa. <laughs> all right, so that's all for hobby news. Now to uh, talk about the whips, and I'm going to shut up for a little bit and let the other two talk for a bit. Starting with. Oh, uh, this is uh, some work got down the hind. I got the cockpit all assembled and got the fuselage closed up. Um, also got the rings done. I don't have a picture of them, but I mean, it's it's, been, it's a typical to me a kid. It just went together beautifully. It is a very nice cockpit. Yeah, the cockpit dude is fucking gorgeous. That paint, the paint job you did on it is nice. Well, thank you guys. I I can't I remember. It... Good. Money is. Um, I fell into a rabbit hole from uh, going through uh, large scale planes forms about the interior color of this, 
And, you know, they have uh, some unrestored uh, cockpit parts, you know, showing that it was a sandy, like between a sandy uh, color and with a, just a touch of green to it. So I I mix this with a sandy yellow color and some yellow green mixed in, and I think it looks pretty close. Yeah, it's looking awesome. Thank you. Very nice. Didn't, is there any aftermarket in it, or is it just out of the box? Uh, yeah, this is, again, this is the Tamiya kit, but I've used the uh, Quinta uh, Studios uh, 3D decals, mainly just for the instrument panel. And, uh, but this is, these was for the Hasegawa kit, but uh, they worked uh, pretty well for this. I just had to cut them into four pieces to get them to uh, contour to the instrument panel. Oh, nice. Very nice. And then went to the IPMS Roscoe Turner uh, last weekend and picked up some kits. Got a Dragon M4 Sherman, the composite hall with the, from the Pacific Theater of Operations. Uh, of yeah. course, I have to pick up a 251. It's like I only paid $20 for that. So That's a steal. Uh, got the M3A1 uh, US half track. I got the A10 Thunderbolt that has uh, a Quinta Studios uh, cockpit in it. So, nice. And at the raffle, I won the Super Hornet. Nice. From, uh, from Ming. So it looks like an amazing kit. Uh, uh, Nick is building one of those at the moment as an Australian one. Oh, nice. Yeah. The Scale Armor has been building a lot of aircraft lately. Yeah. He's turning Point. the tide. Another cool thing about the, the A-10, it comes with uh, decals for the Fort Wayne National Guard, which is like an hour north of me. So. Oh, dude. Well, now you've just got an excuse to uh, go and uh, stalk them. <laughs> oh, we see them fly over here all the time. Because there's a strafing range down at uh, Camp Atterbury, and so they fly from uh, Fort Wayne to Atterbury. Dude, with... With the uh, U.S. military retiring the A-10, it would be pretty cool if you built that for them on like a, like a runway or some shit or however the fuck you build it and mm -hmm. sold it to them. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> fair, fair. I do like the Sherman, the uh, composite hull. I do like the those. Those look cool. Oh, oh definitely. Yes. What uh? What are you gonna do with yours? No idea. Fair enough. <laughs> Garrison, I, we just buy them. We don't plan ahead. It That's was thirty dollars, so That's it's a uh, it's a yeah. I couldn't pass it up. Yeah, I think I think I got you know that Asuka Sherman composite hole I got from the last show we went to. Yeah, I think I got that one for twenty, or maybe it was thirty. I can't remember. Oh shit! And that's about the best Sherman you can get. Oh yeah. The Some. Sukas and the uh, Ryfield models, they make excellent Shermans. Yeah, I, I will say the uh, the one I just built from Dragon was pretty good too, but I also haven't built the Suka models or Ryfield, so... Oh, just wait till you there. get the, to the Asuka, because I built their um, Jumbo, the Sherman Jumbo. Their, it wasn't under the Asuka brand, it was under Tasca, which is a bit weird, but exact same it's boxes. same company. Yeah, same company. So and what's so special about the Asuka Shermans? That well detailed, well put together, a lot of cool additional things. Like you know how you're talking to Christian about that um, exhaust vent. Yeah. Well, the Asuka ones, they build it so because that's an exhaust that can be extended or retracted depending on what they're doing and what the conditions are. Mm -hmm. They actually build it in a way that you it is movable, so you can choose to have it either in or out. What? Yeah, so like the one I've got, you can uh, if you build it right, you can swing it back and forth. The suspension is really cool because you can it's completely within the bogey itself. Like the one that I got, you got given a sheet of um, like rubber, and you cut it you cut it to fit and layer it in the suspension, so you can lower it or raise it however much you want. So like say for a jumbo, the front two front sus uh, bogies are maxed out because of the weight, so you can actually model that. So you can show max like the uh, suspension maxed out on the front and not so much on the back, and so you can adjust it all. It's uh, like 
it's those sort of things that make them really good. Mm-hmm. Oh shit! There's no. F- Hang on a second. I'm about to pull mine out. <laughs> Do I, it. I've looked a little bit, but I haven't like looked that far into it because this one came with a. It came with a resin stowage set. Oh, nice! Oh, nice. From, does it, does uh, it have a, gear. Has it got rubber band tracks? Uh, I think it does. Let me see. see. Yeah, the one that the one that I built is the Jumbo Sherman did, but I got to say yep. they're the best, like most well yeah. detailed rubber tracks I've ever used. Like I don't uh, mind. Uh, yeah, using. these these are. I remember showing these to Clint at the show. These were absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, very well done rubber tracks. And honestly, there doesn't look like too many parts in this kit, which is a good. I mean, I'm not complaining at all about that. That's to me, that's nice. Mm. The 50 looks nice. It has drilled out gun barrels. Uh, Where's the actual Sherman barrel, though? That's what I want to know. I can't remember. Oh. I don't think they're slide molded gun barrels, though. Oh, they're two piece. Yeah. yeah, but they fit. They fit pretty well. That's good. Just get a metal one and replace it? Yeah. Yeah, the problem with that, though, Clint, is they cost a shit ton of money. (laughs) eBay. You can get one on eBay for like eight to ten bucks. Oh, well, fuck me, then. (laughs) I'll say less. (laughs) But does does it have a rubber mat or like something like that to um, cut up? Oh, let me see. Sorry, I didn't even fucking look for the rubber mat. Uh, I got too excited about the gear. Uh, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Oh, it does. There's something. Oh, is that rubber? Should be something, you know, just something that would, like, in the instructions will tell you to cut it and then you layer it to however high you want the suspension to sit. Let me see. Let me look in the instructions. Cause... And it's even, it's even got like, because it's like, you know, something that's a bit spongy. So you can actually press it down into the diorama and it will, you know, rock up and down a bit. So you can actually make it look a bit more realistic. Yes. Oh my God, it does. Robert, yep. Holy <laughs> shit. That is fucking cool. And that is why everyone loves Asuka Sherman's. Mm-hmm. Dude, this thing! Oh, I'm I'm gonna do a Normandy scene with this one. So, <laughs> oh my god, that is fucking awesome. Maybe like, uh, not Breakcore Manor. Where was it? The uh, the second armor division broke out the paratroopers from. Um, like, right outside of Carantan, wasn't it? Yeah, Carantan. Yeah, I, I only know that scene. from Band of Brothers. Huh. Fair enough. I got a RFM uh, Firefly in the stash, and it's uh, got a completely workable suspension. Can't wait to start that. Dude, the value gear, the because it comes with value stowage resin gear, and this shit looks awesome. <laughs> yeah, we need to get the guy from value gear on. He's a really cool guy. Uh, Yeah, dude, this is freaking sweet. Wooden board. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Fucking. <laughs> yeah, we we, we just heard from Jeans Titan. Like that was <laughs> that that was good, awful. Good thing I don't have jeans on. <laughs> wink, wink. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, great heavens. <laughs> <laughs> Rocking the gray sweatpants. Uh, black shorts tonight. Black shorts oh. tonight. All right. Uh, so it will be like, why you've got, why have you got your concealed carry on you with you? <laughs> no, 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 just you, looking babe. at it's on the counter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So these are my webs. I got two slides tonight. This is a little overview for my Battle of Tarwa 1943 diorama that I'm making. Basically. The main subject here is going to be the Sherman, which is nicknamed China Gale, which was one of the main Shermans who pushed the second day's advance towards the airfield. So I'm showcasing Marines and China Gale going up uh, Green Beach straight to the airfield, being counterattacked by Japanese troops trying to hold them back. Uh, It's got a little bunker. It's a resin bunker that I've used some foam to make some ground terrain. Um around the sides of it that'll be it'll have like a it'd be like a sandy little dune right there with some grass on it 
and then um, in the back there's a trench leading out, uh, trench that breaks off of the diorama, blast craters, five palm trees, which I just got the fifth palm tree in the middle today, and then a Japanese anti-tank stops just before the airfield. Very nice. It's looking pretty cool. I like the uh, Japanese officer. Oh, the the sword? Yeah, that's fucking... I'm very excited. Like, whenever I was priming these guys up, like, I did, like, a, th a th two-thirds coating of black as a base primer, and then I went over it with white, and it makes it look nice and gray, but the shadows on these things are great, and looking at the officer, like, this figure w took the, the least amount of work uh, to make him look good. Like, I just added his sword and his fucking... an aftermarket... Uh, sheath for a sword and that was it i'm very excited to paint him really like how you integrated that bunker into the groundwork thank you yeah i was looking because you saw the original setup i had it was just going to be on the corner there and i was going to do groundwork leading up to it but i was like you know what all over tarwa and pictures and shit like the only big standing bunkers really are the big ones on the end of the island and a couple before the airfield kind of towards the center and all the rest of them were like dug in either coconut palm or palm tree bunkers or very small concrete pillboxes. Yeah. So I said, you know what, this is I'm gonna keep it more realistic, make it flow better. And I'm really glad I did because I'm even just the foam there, I, I agree. I'm gonna be a little bit of a asshole here. I brag a little bit. I'm very, very pleased with how it's coming out. Definitely looks really nice. Thank you. Um all right, so this is the Dragon M4A2 Tarwa build. This is going to be China Gale. It's uh, this was before I primed it black and did a white overcoating. Um, the additions that I added was the uh, antenna, which is a .008 uh, guitar string wire, and then on the back I made out of brass sheeting. The rear waiting vent is what I call it. I don't know if that's its proper term or not. Um, then I added the white string, the jerry cans, and the bucket. Everything else came with the kit. The metal barrel, all the photo etch. Um, this fucking... This kit was so much fun to do. And this is the first kit that I've actually glued the tracks together, but I left them open so I can take them off and paint them separately. Okay. And because uh, I've always been super intimidated by doing that, so did that with these, and uh, yeah, just really, really nice kit. I would buy the Sherman and build it again. It was that good. Now it's that bucket. Is that from the Tamiya set? Yes. Yeah. Let's well, say because they they are comically overscaled. Oh yeah, co yeah, very much overscale. Yeah. But you mustn't always mustn't forget a bucket. Yes, always need a bucket. Facts. I even thought about getting uh, a couple of the tools from that kit because it comes with some like wrenches and stuff. I thought about putting a couple wrenches in there, like a wrench and a screwdriver, and then putting a rag over them and keep them in, the, in there. Oh, but yeah. I'll probably do that once I get her all painted up. But I wanted to keep this tank very minimal because there's no picture of China Gale herself, but there's pictures of all the other Shermans on that were mm -hmm. that fought on Tarwa and they're from the same, you know, tank unit. So they're going to be very similar. Uh, I did take a little bit of my own creativeness and I added the, uh, the tracks on the side of the turret. I hadn't seen that on any of the other Shermans, but I figured, fuck it. it I thought it looks good. I wanted something there, but yeah. very excited for the, uh, the paint scheme. Do nice olive drab. And then a uh, nice post shading. And then I've got Archer fine transfer decals for uh, this one. So make sure you do a couple test rounds with uh, some them transfers that you're not going to use. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the game plan. I got a wooden dowel set out to make my my little bit, and then yeah, I'll definitely trust me. I'm not gonna. I don't want to fuck this up because I don't want to buy another set. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, right. Up next is me, and I finally got the uh, Hornet 
all finished uh, last weekend. Sexy. Nice. So, only took me, yeah, took me two days to finish it. So I got the, because, uh, yeah, ultimately, once you're all set, the carrier doesn't actually take too long to paint or anything like that. There's not much to it. And then I spent a day building the uh, water-based diorama for it. Um, it's just that's so much fun. Yeah. I mean, it was just uh, aluminium foil, and then I glazed it with multiple greens and blues until I eventually got what I wanted. And then yep. the whitewash around the back and the sides is toilet paper. And Hell it, yeah. AK still, AK still water and toilet paper, and it's not even painted. Like, Dude, I was that's gonna, fucking awesome. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna paint it, but then when I, when I finished it, it's like, actually, this looks kind of good as it is. I'm just gonna leave it. <laughs> yeah, it's semi-transparent. Hmm. Kind of, yeah. Made it look more natural than I could make it myself, sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, pretty pleased how it ended up uh, in the end, and yeah, quite happy with it. So, cool. Do a little raid. Hell yeah. And I'm going to be making a video for my YouTube channel on this, but uh, one of the reasons we couldn't record was because I was at Warbirds over Wanaka, uh, this supposedly the Southern Hemisphere's biggest air show. Um, debatable, but anyway. So I got a selection of some of the uh, highlight aircraft that I got to go and see. So, of course... In the top left, we have an Avro Anson Mark One that's been uh, restored for a long time. This one won an award for best restoration ever, sort of thing, or like worldwide. They were they got everything like everything's original on it to the point like a lot of things are original to the point they bought maps and pencils that were made in 1940 to put it <laughs> in it. So Holy they like went fuck. next level. Yeah, and the Anson is just a real nice aircraft in general you know it's a real beautiful thing when it's flying of course uh with the the Haviland dragon dragon rapide as well just below it uh bottom left that is uh steadfast an air racer it's uh base it was built in 1970s in czechoslovakia it is the airframe of a yak 3 but with the radial engine from a caribou uh transport okay. aircraft which is it's similar to the Corsair's uh, Pratt & Whitney uh, Wright R2400, but it's, like, more powerful, I think. How and dare it, you say that? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> this this thing bro has, like, seven world records uh, for speed at the Renault Air Races, so it is really, really cool to watch. It's so fast. Dude, that's fucking awesome. Uh, then, of course, we've got the uh, Mark 9 Spitfire, top, le top right, the um, FG um, 4U Corsair. Got to see that flying again, which uh, I'm sure would make Garrison a bit jealous. <laughs> we bit. Yeah. And then, uh, and then one of the two Mustangs with the New Zealand markings. That one was a vehicle restoration. As well as what, had, what didn't come up, or is it in the... Next slide. No, as well as there was a, they were showcasing another uh, De Havilland Mosquito. So that's the out of the that one's going to the states. So it was a commission build. Out of the five flying mosquitoes, guess how many have been built in my home city in Auckland? Mm, three, four, four of them. Damn. Like we. We now like commission build mosquitoes for people. <laughs> like we've got all the molds and stuff set up. So, um, yeah, little fun fact about that. So, of course, seeing a mosquito fly is always just a real treat as well. Not the kind that you want to slap out of this guy. No, but and I got to see like all of these aircraft all up in the sky all at once in formation. So that was also real cool. Uh, as well you, as having you sent a video of that too, didn't you? Yep, yep, but I'll be making a compilation video for all of this stuff, so I'll probably chuck that on my own YouTube channel and probably make one for the uh, podcast channel as well. Why not? Let you guys Hell see yeah. it. I'm and your channel too. as well, also seeing, because there's a transport museum as part of the um, airfield as well, 
which I found a MiG-21, a Czechoslovakian MiG-21 fish bed two-seat trainer in a real cool tiger scheme. That's top left, uh, as well as a MiG-15 trainer, also from Czechoslovakia, I think. Both of them from there. Greyhound. An M8 Greyhound that was beautifully restored and has the original bullet holes in it. They left them in. They didn't. They didn't weld over them or anything. They just left them. That's fucking tits. Uh, an M3 Scout car, a Mark V Centurion, just sitting out in the open in a deplorable state. I mean, you're walking around it. You're like, just uh, you get, just put a bit of work into it, and it could look nice, you know. <laughs> just give it a paint job, fuck. Yeah, uh, I believe a Mark III Valentine tank, just sitting out in the open as well, looking. If you want. If you want to see, if you want rust bloody references, it's a great one for that. <laughs> as well as a uh, Hemet. Is that a Hemet? Bottom right, the bit, the um, the giant truck. I don't know. It looks like something from Mad Max. Mm-hmm. I think it's a Hemet. But yeah, so they're really cool. There was an F six, a couple of F sixteens from the. Um, uh, American base in Japan came down with a tanker. We had a C-17 from Hawaii come over, so they were flying around. That was really cool. Um, the, hey, you got to see why we don't have free healthcare. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we saw the last flight of the New Zealand C-130H Hercules and the flight of the brand new C-130J, as well as the P-8 Poseidon. And actually, they had all three of them flying in formation, which is a tricky thing to do because the Hercules had to be redlining, basically, with full th- redlining the throttle. And the P08 and then the P8 had to be almost at stall speed just for them to be in formation. <laughs> That's fucking great. Yeah. So they, uh, they had that flying and they did like, they were doing flare dumps and flybys and stuff like that. Where there were 11 Yak 52. Um, Soviet trainers. Uh, so oh, they were flying, yeah. doing aerobatics and all that. They were really cool. Uh, fun fact about those, because of course, you know, they're built in to train Soviet pilots, right? They yes. only had a fuel tank that could last two hours of flight. <laughs> and that was by design, because really? in their airfields were three hours from the border. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I see what they did there. <laughs> yeah, just to stop those cheeky little defections, you know. Someone got a bright idea. They're just like, nah, we've thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what else? Um, oh, yeah. In the Transport Museum, they had, um, I think it was built by Lockheed. It was like a, a prototype transport for World War II, but it wasn't used. But they built a couple of them, and they ended up in private hands. This particular aircraft... Um, was used in the States after the war as a flying brothel mm. called the Chicken Coop. The and, Chicken Coop? And the aircraft was named the Flying the Coop. Uh, yeah, so this thing was a flying brothel. <laughs> Don't mind if I do entertaining <laughs> myself in the Chicken Coop. <laughs> and then eventually it found its way to New Zealand is now currently like got an inch of dust covering it, and which is a real, real shame to be honest because it's also a really you, nice aircraft you know why they have dust covering it right uh do i want to know <laughs> covering up all the evidence <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so did a, it was a three-day event down in wanaka it was really really fun really cool and yeah don't think i don't think i'll go again though because it's just a lot of efforts but instead my dad and i are looking for next easter we're going to go to the omaka air show which is um i think a little bit better they've got all the world war one uh aircraft that have been restored and built and all of that and they have nice. a lot and most of them are flying as well oh hell yeah so they got those um the warbirds including i didn't know this we have a flying Wolf 190 what yeah there's not many of them around uh, no. So, yeah, I didn't know that. We, so we've got a Focke Wolf, we've got the Avenger there, and a whole bunch of other stuff, so 
Yeah. I, I know we shit on, like, crowd aircraft all the time, but, dude, the Falk Wolf 190 is such a freaking dope fighter. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, There is uh, one at the National Museum of the United States Air Force that's airworthy. Yeah, I think there's only, like, a couple of them, aren't there? Even less yep. BF-109s as well. There's one there as well. They also got a ME-262 that's airworthy, and a... Oh my fucking uh, god. They also got a Comet, but... You know. <laughs> <laughs> Supposedly is airworthy. Yeah, well, they I don't think they ever was, even brand new. No. Well you know you know there was only one Allied pilot who did a test flight in a comet and then they, everyone was banned from flying it. <laughs> Which is, you know, right, for obvious reasons. Thing. Yeah, because not... just refueling it you could blow yourself up. Mm. What? Oh yeah. It was a two part um fuel. And it was so reactive, if they were in container trucks and they were too close to each other, the vapors, if they mixed, caused an explosion. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Um, like, if you, were mix- if you were doing the mixing and you happened to get it wrong, you- there was not enough time for you to realize you made a fuck up. Because by the time you did uh, you you were, like, disintegrated. Um, <laughs> All right, honey. Um, I'm heading to work. Uh, if I make it back, I would love, love lasagna tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, the fuels were so reactive that the fuel lines had to be made out of glass and porcelain, uh, which means they're a bit fragile, and the components were so corrosive, they didn't burn you as such. They melted you. Yep. Like, God damn. Actually melted you. There was one pilot who landed, flipped over. The aircraft was all right, but he broke one of the fuel lines it, and um, seeped into the cockpit. The rescue guys, by the time they got to him and righted it, all they said all they saw was a pool and a uniform sitting on top of it. That's that what it did scary. to people. Yeah, and that guy was alive. Oh. And by the way, he was alive when he landed like he he was alive when it flipped over he was alive through the whole process until he wasn't mm, i wonder I how that story. quickly like because i know like when you burn to death like the fire will like burn your nerves so you eventually just won't feel it and you'll get smoke inhalation and pass out but like i wonder how that compares to being melted alive I think that's that an answer shit. we don't really want. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I wonder, because think of like napalm, for example, right? Like what that does to a human and like how often we used it. Like what was so bad about this shit that we, it was just too, I mean, obviously for aircraft, it was, you know, too dangerous to use, but for fucking shit like that, like. <laughs> Charlie's on the tree line, boys. Fucking send it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, just kind of reminds me. So you talk about, you know, things that we want to see all the time in the industry. LCM threes. There's only a couple of them, but there we have no LCM sixes. But so my only option, I guess, is to get an LCM-3, convert it to a 6, and then convert that into a Vietnam River uh, monitor. Mm. With the, with mm. the big fucking flamethrowers on it. Yeah. Yes. That's something I definitely want to see. Hell yeah. There's one company that makes a resin one, and it's like $300. Oh, no. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's, a bit, that's a little bit much, isn't it? Just yeah. a wee bit. Yeah, I don't think you could justify that one to the missus. <laughs> nope. No. What's this $300 charge? Hey, man, um, I, I went I've been meaning to have this talk. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, which one's worse? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what do I want to admit to? <laughs> You'd be so like, you went um, to a what? It's like, I went to a brothel. No, you went to the model store, didn't you? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> what did the counselor talk about, honey? If you're going to make impulse buys like this, I need to know. This is a step back in our progress. <laughs> I just couldn't help myself. Alright, lads. So, 
with all the Pacific builds going on, you might be thinking, why is everybody building Pacific stuff? Well, one, it's awesome. Uh, two, it doesn't get enough recognition. And three, we've got a Pacific group build going on, running from March 1st to September 1st. So if you would like to find out more about this, see what kind of prize we have in store for the competition submissions, or just uh, submit something on a recreational basis, go ahead, join the Discord, find out everything you need to know, come see what everyone else is building, and show us what you got. Same thing applies. We have a science fiction group build running March 1st to September 1st, except there is no prize for this one. This is purely just for fun. Bring anything sci-fi related, show us what you can do, and see what others got. And of course, the continuously running HIDF group build. Same thing applies. Uh, if you'd like to learn about HIDF, uh, we got a video on our uh, YouTube channel, or it's one of the episodes that talks about the HIDF. There's quite a bit of HIDF builds as well. Uh, it's literally anything you want to do. It's off-brand Fiji, you know. So if you need a palate cleanser, something that if you make it and someone's like, that's inaccurate, you can tell them, uh, fuck you. It doesn't matter because it's HIDF. And go back your day. <laughs> <laughs> and once you're finished listening to this episode, go check out all the other podcasts out there. Stuff like Scale Model Podcast, Just Making Conversation, Model Insanity, Plastic Model Mojo, all of that good stuff. Go check them out at scalepodcast.com. You'll see them all there with links. And, of course, we like to thank the Patreons at the end of each episode. That is Paul Gallagher, Lord Floki, J Robert Judson, and Robert Brisbane. Your support helps us keep the lights going, helps us get, uh, just, you know, makes life a little bit easier for us on the financial side of things. Of course, if you want to join the Patreon, just go on to www.patreon.com forward slash micromachines podcast, where for as little as about $3 a month, even a dollar a month, I think it is, you get access to all the stuff we can't put on YouTube, all the jokes and, you know, topics and stuff like that that, you know, can't go on YouTube, goes on there because, yeah. But Hi. we have come to the end of the episode. <laughs> Is there anything else that Garrison or Clint would like to add to this at the end of it? Uh, thank you guys for watching. We always appreciate it. If you guys have any feedback, good or bad, let us know. Join the Discord. Join the group builds. And uh, hope to see you guys next week. Clint? Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> All right. I guess we should probably close this one down then, eh, lads? Yeah, Sounds so, good. If you have made it this far, thank you for listening to the Micro Machines podcast. We will we thank you all for watching and listening to this rather... I mean, there's an uh, amateur hour, and then there's this, um, whatever you want to. <laughs> I think we put a new definition on it. But <laughs> until then, we will see you in the next episode. Bye for now. See you later, folks. See you.